All right, y'all, today we're going to be doing the last sermon for our part one of our Genesis series called Origin Stories. Um, and this is going to be uh, an awesome way to end the series right before Christmas. Um, but as we start and dive in, I would like, if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. So we're going to be diving in the story of Babel. Genesis 11. As you're turning there, I just want to, again, remind us of the context. Genesis 1 through 11 is a type of genre in literature called archetypal genre, which means that it's more than just a story that we're reading, a random story. It's trying to tell us something more, a little deeper, something truer, something more universal about all of us. It's saying something about humanity. And Moses is trying to lay out for us what our human beings like through Genesis 1 through 11. So with that in mind, we're going to start reading from verse 1. And we'll kind of take it and piece it together bit by bit, all right? So Genesis 1. First, we're going to talk today about humanity's rebellion. Okay, that's the first topic we want to hit on. Humanity's rebellion. So chapter 11, verse 1 says this. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words, and as people migrated from uh, the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Real quick pause. So the author first observes and tells us that at this time, all you humanity were one people and they had one language, all right? So let's keep reading from verse three. And they said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly and they have bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So when we first read the story up to this point, we're like, what's the big deal? They're just trying to make a city, right? Makes sense, there's a lot of people, they need some systems, some infrastructure. Makes a lot of sense, all right? And so we have to, kind of dive into this, what statement right here, what they're saying to one another through the context of the book. And we'll, remember, Genesis 1 through 11 is trying to tell us something more deeper about humanity, right? So if you guys remember, uh, as we have earlier on discussed, God had created humanity uniquely as his image bearers. We uniquely in all creation bear the image and reflect God, our triune God. And he created us, and he gave us this command in Genesis 1 to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth with his image. That's what we are called to do. That's what we are created to do. And after that, we see that humanity keeps screwing this up, right? We don't do what God called us to do. We, want to be, we don't want to be an image bearer of God. We want to be God. We want to usurp his authority. And so, last couple of weeks, we just dove into the story of Noah and the flood. And after Noah and the flood, he, God tells Noah again the same mandate to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. That's in Genesis 9, 1, and 7. So there's a pattern there, y'all. Humanity, all humanity, even to now, we are called to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with God's image. And yet, in this text, what do we see? Humanity rebels against God's command. Again, they say, come, let us build ourselves a city. So instead of being fruitful, multiplying, filling the earth, instead of scattering to the ends of the earth, they, just, they said, no, let's camp here. Let's build ourselves a city here. We're not going anywhere. What do they say? Let us make a name for ourselves. So instead of being about the glory of God, the name of God, they're about building their own name. So what do they do? They decide they're going to build a tower that goes to the heavens, it says. A couple of different observations here. First, you've got to remember the city. At this, con at this time, the city is more than just a city as we think about it. The city represents security. The city represents stability and safety. The city represents identity and pride. So they're saying, let's build the city for ourselves. We don't, we don't want to, to trust in God. 
We don't want to depend on God for safety. We want our own stability. We want our own safety. We don't want to be dependent on God anymore. And it says here, a tower to make our name great. To make our name great. In other words, it's about giving glory to ourselves rather than God. So in other words, the building of this tower in this city of Babel was more than just an architectural project. It was an act of rebellion against our Creator God. This tower was more than a building. It was an idol. What is an idol? An idol is that thing <clears throat> which you love, trust, and obey more than God. An idol is a thing which you love, trust, and obey more than God. An idol, another definition of idol, is a good thing which we turn into a God thing because we look to it instead of God to meet our ultimate needs in our lives. That's an idol. Now some of you may be wondering, as we're talking about the story of Babel, Dave, this happened like thousands of years ago, what does it have to do with me? And again, I keep re referring back to this, Genesis was written to explain our own humanity. It's like a mirror that Moses is putting in front of our face. And as we read the story of Genesis in the Tower of Babel, Moses is saying, look at your own heart. Are you really any different? You see, here's the big idea I want you to get from Babel. In our sinfulness, we rebel against God's rule by building idolatrous towers in our own hearts and our lives. I'll say that again. In our sinfulness, we rebel against God's rule by building idolatrous towers in our own hearts and lives. So some of y'all are looking at me still a little bit funny because we're talking about Babel. So let me see if I can make this plain. Uh, we're going to do a little illustration here. So work with me. Um, for me, as I was growing up, one of the hardest things that I, I was struggling with in my faith was believing that God could love someone like me when I know that I'm not good enough, when I know that I haven't achieved enough, because for me, love and belonging was something that you had to earn through your own performance. And so what I would do is I would, you know, try to, to build this tower of finding love and belonging from somewhere else other than God by looking to school and grades and achievements, by trying to get more scholarship, more awards, by trying to uh, make be popular at school, make more friends, or get into that college that, uh, you know, that had that little, you know, extra something, something to it, right? Um, and, and also for me, I was a musician. And so I would try to get more awards, try to win more competitions, and try to, you know, uh, get into Allstate, get into music school, get into all these different things that held prestige. My GPA in college, and, and uh, what else was there? You guys see what I'm trying to say? We do this, right? And honestly, you do this too. Your career, your job, you try to go for that next promotion, try to get that next, more letters behind your name, try to get that nicer house, that nicer possession, that car that, you know, really represents who you are, right? Your kids, y'all, we can, we can idol, idolize our kids. Some of us go, I never got to achieve this, I want you to have what I never got a chance to have. We place our kids and their success and their extracurriculars above God. I can't tell you how many times I've heard kids just completely burned out. Going, how, why is it that I can never be good enough to be loved by my parents unless I am number one? Right? We keep playing this game by building these towers. And maybe your heart's longing and your deepest insecurities is different from mine, but you too are building towers in your own hearts in your own lives. So with that being said, I want to ask you, what is your tower? What does the Tower of Babel look like in your own life? What are you idolizing? Maybe it's your boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your kids. How many social media followers you got? Maybe it's your sports team, the Cowboys. They've let you down for a while. Or for you World Cup people, I'm not going to go there. It's a little bit rough for us. What, is, what about your wealth? 
your retirement plan, your investment portfolio, your race, your ethnicity. For you seminarians here, what if it's your seminary degree? And just knowing more theology about God. Or if we're not careful, it can even be, our idol can even be ministry that we do for God. And we confuse activity for God with intimacy with God. What is your idol? All of us have it. John Calvin says that our hearts are like idol factories. That even if we get rid of one, we keep producing another and another and another. Keep churning more idols. Keep drifting away from the Lord. What does that look like for you? What tower are you trying to build? Maybe it's the tower of success. Try to prove your worth or your value through your accomplishments. Or maybe it's the tower of self-sufficiency, especially here in the West. It's all about, I got this. If I just work harder, work smarter, work longer, everything will work out. Maybe it's a tower of people-pleasing. There are things that you know is right that you can't do because you are too afraid of other people's opinions about you. Maybe it's a tower of pursuing the American dream and the comfort that it, it causes us to dream of more than God's kingdom. The suburban life tells us a story. Man, you're the good life. You have your own house. You have a dog. You have your kids and your wife picket fence. Is that what you're pursuing? Or the immigrant dream of trying to make your parents proud by your accomplishments? Bringing them honor. Or maybe it's the tower of being a good person by your own morality, by your own ministry, trying to earn God's favor. What is your tower? Now, some of you guys might be wondering, how can I tell if something's really an idol in my life? So I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna tell you some diagnostic kind of ideas, okay? First sign that this thing might be, whatever's popping up in your head, might be an idol in your life, is that you invest more time, talent, and treasure in it than you should. Like, you have your list of priorities in your life. If you say, God matters first, then, I don't know, for me, then it's my wife, then it's my family. So you have these priorities, but you spend way more time on this thing than you should. Some of you guys are looking at me funny on that. Well, if you are confused, check your bank account. What do you spend more of your money on? Check your Google search history, or your Chrome history, whatever you use on your browser. What are you looking up? What are you spend, spending most of your time in? What's capturing your passion and your affections? The second question might be that you are defensive and angry when someone challenge you, challenges you on it. When one of your friends, or maybe a church member says, or maybe your parents says, hey, you really are spending more time on this. You really are doing too much. I'm concerned for you. And the immediate reaction that you have is defensiveness and anger. Don't touch this. Don't tell me this. I'm good. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. He's really bad. You should see he's really addicted. What is that thing for you? Lastly, you can't imagine functioning in your life without this thing. You can't imagine living your life without it. Some of you guys, if I just took your cell phone for one week, how would you do? <laughs> Psychologically. Right? See, if, if I just took your cell phone for one week, you would get so anxious. Right? Checking what emails did I miss? What text messages did I miss? Right? And all this anxiety starts to swell up because you've created for yourself this image of a stable life, a balanced life, and everything teeters and everything's about just keeping this the same. And just like this Jenga set right here, this tower that we build, we have built our lives and tried to achieve this balance, this optical balance. That everything, if we just keep it this way, everything is okay. That life is okay. But I'm going to tell you something. We have a God who loves you enough to start shaking up your life. To start rocking your life. 
If everything that you held, I'm so sorry that no, that lady didn't. Right <laughs> I probably should have done it this way. <laughs> and everything you thought was stable and good, one thing, one email, one text, one call, one conversation, you take it all away. But God doesn't shake up your life because he doesn't love you. It says rather in the scriptures that he disciplines those that he loves. He wants your life to truly be grounded, to be built upon the rock and not the sand, to be built upon him and his truth more than you, what you, your imagination, your own dreams. And so he shakes up your tower. So again, what is, what is your talent? What, are the, what is the thing that you are pursuing? What is that thing that you are building for yourself rather than for God's glory? So humanity rebelled against God's command, choosing, again, to build up their own tower rather than following God's truth and what God had declared. So let's look at now how God responds. So first we looked at humanity's rebellion. Let's look at God's response starting in verse 5. Verse 5 says this, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. I love how this text, the author tells us the Lord had to, been, he came down. In other words, he is so high, he had to descend. He had to stoop down and say, hey, what's this tiny little thing that these creatures are, are building? It makes me think about, um, my, my son and I used to love playing Legos. A little bit less now. But we had this thing, uh, this movie called Le the Lego Movie. How many of you guys have seen the Lego Movie? Okay, some hands in here, right? Everything is awesome, right? <laughs> um, and this Lego Movie, which you see this like amazing uh, picture of these cities and and these like visual like amazingness, right? And at the end of the day, all these these this amazing city and everything that that's there in this movie, what you find is just on a table uh, at a house in a basement that's owned by Will Ferrell, right? And as I was reminding myself of, of this text, I, I just can't you know, help but wonder, like when we think something is so grand and great, when we build this thing up and make it all, like our entire lives about, about this one thing, when God sees it, he has to bend down. He has to stoop down and go, what is it? So, <clears throat> God came down, and let's look at what he says about these small creatures he created. Verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. So get the get. Get this, these small creatures that he created, humanity, when they are united in something, even God says the, the unity of humanity is powerful. He said this is, that nothing can stop them, that there's nothing impossible for them. You see, God created humanity to be unified as his image bearers in him alone. But what we see here in this text is that humanity is now unified in rebellion, in evil, right? We see them all unifying in the wrong thing. As we think about this, let's just unpack this a little bit more. Can you imagine how awful it would be today if we had one global, monolithic, anti-Christian, autocratic regime throughout the entire world who had the power and the capacity to just stomp out the church in one fell swoop with one edict. I mean, isn't it in that sense a good thing that the nations of the world right now are watching each other skeptically, trying to, with mistrust, right? That we don't have this all-world regime at the moment. It curves the evil, the evil that could be. 
So in light of humanity now being united in rebellion against him, what does the Lord do? Verse 7, come, let us go down, and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there was there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So in light of humanity's rebellion, our triune God decides to disrupt this construction project by confusing their ability to communicate with one another. Have any of you been in a team at work or maybe at school that was just terrible with communication? Some of you guys are like, yep, you're talking about my job right now. <laughs> right? It's just a toxic environment. Nothing happens. The communication breaks down and, and they stop working. And this is the first time in the scriptures where we see differences in languages being created. Right? And through this, the Lord causes humanity to disperse, to scatter throughout the world. So from this incident, this act of rebellion, we see there are three consequences for humanity. First, we see that humanity, which was once united, is now divided. We see that God divides humanity by their languages as a judgment upon and a restraint against the arrogant, presumptuous, God-mocking unifiers of global rebellion. Second, we see that humanity is now dispersed, not gathered. Third, we see that humanity is now disowned. Remember, this is Noah's descendants. These were the guys that God had saved from the flood. But now they had turned their, their backs against God. And now they became, they are no longer God's people. Now the story ended right there, in Genesis 11. Man, what a tragedy that would be, right? After the flood, after everything. If all humanity was just lost. Disowned, dispersed, divided. That would be tragic. But thank God that after Genesis 11 comes Genesis 12. So this next point, let's look at Babel's reversal. In Genesis 12, God calls a man named Abram, and guess what he says to him. He says this in verse 1. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So after God pronounces judgment in Genesis 11 to all humanity and scattering them, now in Genesis 12 he calls one man and his family, Abram, and he says, I will make your name great. Remember, Babel, they tried to make their own names great. But here God is saying, I will make your name great, Abram. And through you, I will make a nation. And through this nation, I will bless all the families, all the languages, all the nations of the earth. And so through Abram comes Israel, the nation of Israel. And then God calls the nation of Israel in Exodus 19.6, to be a kingdom of priests for all nations. And in Isaiah 49, 6, he calls them to be a light among all the nations. You see, Israel was not supposed to just be living for themselves, sheltered them to themselves. They were supposed to live in a way that attracts the nations around it to God. But what we understand from this story throughout the scriptures is like Adam, like Cain, like Noah's descendants, Israel too fails to fulfill their calling. And so what happens? Jesus comes. You see, our God isn't like us. He isn't conditional like us. God loves us with that never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. 
And in his grace, God himself chooses to send his own son, Jesus Christ. And unlike Adam, unlike Cain, unlike Noah's descendants, and even unlike Israel, Jesus perfectly fulfills God's word and his will. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, not my will. He didn't want to die on the cross in his flesh, but he says, not my will, but your will, Lord, be done. And through his life and his death, Jesus brings salvation to mankind. And he reinstitutes God's kingdom and his rule on earth, and he reconciles mankind to God and also to one another, all these nations. And this is why in Matthew 28, verse 18, in the Great Commission, Jesus himself says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of what? Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice the similarities there between be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with his image. And this great commission that he gives us. We are filling the earth with disciples of Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But this is not the end, y'all. Turn with me to Acts 2, verse 2. Acts 2, verse 2. Actually, Acts 2, verse 1. It says this in Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galilean? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Fast forward to verse 11. Both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Have any of you guys ever read this story of Pentecost and ask yourself, what does this mean? Like we talk about tongues of fire and winds, the Holy Spirit speaking in other languages. What does, what does all this mean? Why is this even in the scriptures? Why is this important? Right? I, I see all, the, all, all our charismatic folks are getting excited. All right. <laughs> um, well... Remember, we're talking about the Tower of Babel, so let's think about the Tower of Babel, and let's, again, observe the, this passage here in Pentecost together. You're going to see a couple of similarities and a couple of differences. First, in both stories, God descends. God comes down, right? Babel, God descends. In Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, through the wind and the fire, this is, was in Old Testament, this was representing the presence of God. So God, the Holy Spirit, comes down. Right? And in both, we see divine action causes people to be able to speak in different languages. Right? And then in one, we see that people in Babel, we see that when this happens, they all of a sudden can't understand each other. They can't speak each other's language. But in Pentecost, what? All of a sudden, God comes down and they're able to understand each other's language despite of the fact that they are all different. In one, in both, they are confused. And in Babel, the nations are scattered. In Pentecost, the nations are gathered. And in Babel, we see the end of Babel and the end of this united humanity. And in Pentecost, we see the beginning of the church and this diversity of nations coming together now as one. You see, this is not by accident. This is a part of the gospel story of God's heart for the nations. Pentecost is God's reversal of the effects of Babel. Pentecost is a reversal 
of Babel. Humanity, which was once divided because of their united rebellion against God, is now united once more, but this time as one new humanity in Jesus Christ. And this is why Revelation 7 paints for us this picture. Verse 9, it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, and people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Church, in heaven we see a picture of every nation, every nation, every people, every language, every race united together as one for eternity, as one people, as God, in God's kingdom. In other words, Babel did not have the final word. Babel was not God's intention for eternity. It was only temporary. And therefore, Babel cannot be God's design for diversity. It cannot be God's design for diversity. And I think this is important to talk about. Because throughout the history of the church in America, this passage and the story of Babel has often been used to support and argue that God is somehow for segregation. That it's God's design for us all to be apart from one another but again, if you end in the story of Babel, then maybe you can think that. But what about the rest of the scriptures? What about the rest of the gospel? And again, what about the end and what we see in heaven? The church is created to be what? To be a reflection of God's kingdom when what we see in heaven on earth, right? That's why in the Lord's Prayer we say, Lord, uh, Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what we were created for, what we are called to do. Then you might be wondering here, what about then Babel? Like what, what do we do with that? What is the sin then in Babel? Again, the sin in Babel is not diversity. The issue in Babel is not diversity. The issue in Babel is that humanity was united in rebellion against God. That was the sin. The, 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 Diversity that is now divided, that is a consequence of our rebellion. But again, in the gospel, we see a different story. In Pentecost, we see a different story. This diversity is now united, but as it should be in Christ, to multiply God's image. You see, human diversity was not an accident, and human diversity is not a problem. It was actually part of God's design. This is why Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, in God's image we were created, male and female, he created them. Even in our gender, in our diversity, God created us to reflect his triune community. You guys have seen this diagram that we always put up, that icon. This is where this comes from. And so, we were created to be united in Christ. And we are a part now of God's plan of redeeming diversity and humanity and unity of mankind. I can't help but think about the division that we see in our country, the division that we see even in the church. Y'all, we, we do not need to be afraid of the topic of diversity. We have the solution and the answer in Jesus Christ. I believe diversity is one of the greatest apologetics of the gospel today in our day and age. People are longing to know what to do with the diversity that's divided. And they are looking for an answer. What does it look like to reconcile? What does it look like to come together as one? And the gospel, y'all, is the answer. It's not less scripture we need. It's more. This is a part of God's plan. Because one day, we will see every nation, tongue, and tribe. Like, y'all are not symbolically brothers and sisters in Christ. Y'all are not symbolically fellow citizens. Y'all are truly family. Y'all are truly one in Christ. And 
this family here, you better, I know some of them might be a little bit, you know, but you're going to be spending eternity with them. So we better learn how to love one another. Because as we love one another like Christ, John 17 says what? That our unity, in all our diversity, our unity will cause the world around us to ask, who is this Jesus that you guys keep talking about? What is this gospel that you keep talking about? Church, don't you dream of our church becoming a reflection of heaven like that? Right? Don't you dream of God using this church to bring people of every nation, every background, every language to himself? That's why we're here doing what we do, y'all. It's not so that we can become big or famous. We're not, if we're not careful, icon can be this power battle. No, it has to be something different. We have to be different. So, with that being said, we, in all our differences, are called to be united in Jesus Christ alone, nothing else. Jesus has to be the center of the church. And it's, and it's more than just a song that we sing. I love Israel, it's a song on that. But it's more, all right? Jesus be the center, all right? But it has to be our lives. This has to be truly our commitment. But if we're being honest, this is really hard. It's really hard. It often feels like the church, even Icon, but also the church at large, looks more like Babel than like heaven. Right? How so? We're more like Babel when we are divided. The church looks more like Babel in our divisions. Whether it be because of race, ethnicity, economic status, politics, whether you're right or left, or secondary, tertiary, theological issues. The church remains divided. And Mar MLK, Martin Luther King's line that the church, that the 11 a.m. is the most segregated hour in America still rings true today, unfortunately. We look more like Babel when we are divided. Second, we look more like Babel when we are united in the wrong thing. When we are united in the wrong thing, in something else other than Jesus Christ. If we're not careful, we it's too easy for us to replace Jesus with something else as the center of our church. You can replace Jesus first with the tower of my preferences, the Have It Your Way Church. I, I'm not going to show you guys the video, you can look at it on your own time, but John Chris has this funny video, uh, Virtual Church, and basically... He wakes up in the morning, puts on these VR glasses, and it says, like, hey, like, what, what denomination do you want your church to be? Like, how do you want your worship leader or the pastor to dress? How, how convictional do you want the sermon to be? Do you want it to, like, make you feel bad or make you feel inspired and encouraged? Like, it, you get to pick. It's half of your way. But, y'all, that's not the church. And that's not Jesus. And what if, unfortunately... His video is often too true in Christianity today, right? I, I, I read a stat, the average attendance for a church member who supposedly committed is 1.3 times a month. That means to any Bible study, any small group, any church gathering, the average attendance is 1.3 times a month because otherwise it's inconvenient to go to church. And we often base our church or what we want in church based on my style, my conveniences, my passions, my preferences and interests. What do you have for me? I remember a couple years ago, in contrast, I was talking to a pastor from Tanzania. Uh, this was at the Global Proclamation Academy at GTS, where they had 26 pastors from different nations come. And there was a pastor from Tanzania, and he was kind of sharing about his church. And he said his church meets every Sunday under a very large tree. 150 people gathered under a tree. There's no air conditioning, no sound system, nothing. Just a tree. And they worship for three, four hours. And I couldn't help but wonder, man, would that work here? <laughs> like if we didn't have air conditioning, if we didn't have, have awesome worship, if we didn't have programs, would the people of God still 
ferociously, be ferociously committed to gathering together as one. I don't know. If we do not have any of our personal preferences met, would we still be willing to be faithful? We can also replace Jesus at the center of our church with my people, my culture, right? Too often churches just look like it's just one demographic of people. The same life stage. Is this church a singles church, a young adult church? Is it a family church, a married church, right? Is it a, a, a Chinese church, a Korean church, a white church, a black church? We, we're too often, it's about one people, one race, one stage, one standard of life. I remember uh, before in another church where I was ministering, we used to have small groups, and so we had one small group where people started leaving, and I, I was wondering why, why are you guys leaving this group? And so I was talking and asking these questions, and they're, they're like, every single time our group goes out to eat, they want to spend $25 on a dish, and I work a job where I make $10 an hour. I can't afford it. Then another, another person was, every time we go, we go, it's a nice house. And I live in this like one room apartment. And it makes me feel bad every single time I go. That's not reflected, right? Of God's kingdom. Or we can make it about our own ethnicity or race. And again, I'm not, we, we understand this. We are not, we are colorful, not colorblind. We celebrate each of you, your unique ethnicities and heritage and race. All that's great. But at the end of the day, your ethnicity is an adjective, and your citizenship as Christian as in God's kingdom, that's the noun of who you are. That's what we are committed to. And I have too many stories of times where we have placed our ethnicity at the center of what it means to be our church. I remember a time when I was at a Korean church minister, and one of our members invited two young black girls, singles, who they had been praying for, her co-workers, and these girls came, and literally no one, apart from that friend and myself, said hello. No one wanted to sit with them to eat. No one, here's the crazy thing, no one even noticed. They just noticed that they were uncomfortable. When we replace Jesus with anything else, at the center of our church, we become more like that. <coughs> we stop reflecting God's kingdom. And church, we can't do that. We just cannot do that. Only Jesus deserves to be at the center of our church, of Icon Church, because only Jesus gave his life and paid it all to redeem us, to reconcile us. But here's the thing. If Jesus truly is the center of our church, then no matter what background, no matter what race, no matter what socioeconomic class or life stage a person may be, Anybody can come and not only believe in the gospel, but belong with God's people. If Jesus is the center of our church, no matter what your background is, you will be loved here. And we, all of us here, have to be committed to loving that person like Christ, even if we disagree with them on something. We have to be committed to loving them like Jesus. Because at the end of the day, that is God's heart. Us. That's what it looks like for us to reflect Jesus. And again, on that, I'm not saying that you have to agree with every sin or say that sin is not sin. But the gospel is what? That although there's sin, God's grace abounds all the more. And that's what He has given us. And so, church, I pray that we would also extend that to one another and for others, the people that God has called us to serve. So as we conclude, again, the big idea for us today is that in our sinfulness, we rebel against God's rule by building idolatrous towers in our hearts and lives. The question then is, what are the towers that you have built 
in their own heart and their life. And even for our church, what are the towers in our church that we also need to repent of and place Jesus at the center?